Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Studio 78 Podcast. I am your host, Nishé from NishéSnow.com. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is episode 161. Of course, you can find the show notes for this page over at NishéSnow.com slash 161. I'm so excited to have Natasha with me from Shine with Natasha. Some of you guys may already know her, but she is absolutely fabulous. I first started following her years ago as she talked about all things Instagram, and now she has branched out. She's still doing Instagram stuff, but she is awesome also going deep into video and how we can use video on any social media platform. So I'm really, really excited to have her on today. You guys know I've been talking to you guys about video and the power of video. So this is why I'm really, really having people on this season talking about how video can be used to enhance your business. Okay. So a couple of things before I begin. First of all, if you haven't already, head on over to my storefront, dreamsplansideas.com. For you Notion heads, I have a travel template that people are really liking if you're a Notion person. If you're like, what is this whole Notion thing? Don't worry, I've got you. The link to my free Notion template will be on the show notes for this page, or you can head on over to nishaysnow.com slash notion, N-O-T-I-O-N, nishaysnow.com slash notion. And that is an article entitled Notion for Entrepreneurs, How I Organize My Life and Business. And for those who have known me or seen some of my stories, you know, like I have the Notion widgets on my iPhone. I use Notion on my iPad. I use Notion on the desktop. And I really do use it to organize all the things from just organizing things for my business to organizing my day-to-day stuff. It's things as simple as like watering my plants, keeping track, of what I'm reading, keeping track of my favorite websites that I use for inspiration or just that I want to come back to later. So I really have it where I can easily track all the things. And it really is um, my second brain, if you will, because I just don't have the capacity to remember all the things anymore. So be sure to check that out, my friends. Also, remember sharing is caring, my friends. So if you love this episode, please share, share, share. Also, if you love the podcast, please rate me five stars on Apple Podcasts. It goes a long, long way. Leave a review. I would greatly appreciate it. If you're on YouTube, give me a thumbs up. Leave a comment. All of that engagement, my friends, you know it helps. You know it helps. So please do that. And wherever you're listening, to this podcast, please subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Okay, so let's go back to Natasha. Oh my goodness, I think you guys are going to love this episode. The first half of the episode, we just talk about her journey and there's so many good nuggets of inspiration and just also like practical tips in there because she talks about handling like the jump from 5,000 followers to over 40,000 followers, balancing her time once that happened and how she adjusted and modified like the products and services that she offered. We discussed how to build a community and her thoughts on niching down and all the things. And then the second half, we really go into, is Instagram still relevant? And picture versus video, there's always a debate about which is better. And, you know, sometimes people are upset that pictures are going away on Instagram. So we talk about that. Not to say they are going away, but listen to the episode to hear more. And then also we get into some tips on creating video content and generating revenue with video. So this is a episode that is packed, packed full of information that I think you guys will enjoy. And I just think you guys will love just hearing her journey in general. She's someone I follow for a while and I have loved seeing her grow. She is, she is an inspiration. So I was really glad that she was able to come on to the podcast. 
And it's funny, I recorded this actually last fall, and I saved this for the top of the year to just remind everyone that video is so key because I wanted you guys to start 2023 right. So I, I'm really, really excited to start off the the season with my first, I guess, official guest because like, hey, is a co-host really with Natasha. So here we go. Come on, let's do this. Hello, Natasha, and welcome to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have you on because I feel like I was following you from the very beginning and I feel like I've seen your journey (laughs) through the years and I'm like, go Natasha. I've told people to follow you and you've always been from the very beginning, very giving of information and just like very positive. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. That means so much. (laughs) Before we get into... Instagram and video. Can you just tell the listeners just a little bit about Natasha, like a little bit about you before you got started? Yes, absolutely. So I actually started in social media from my passion for writing and storytelling. I wrote for a few online publications, my school newspapers, and I just loved writing and being creative and telling other people's stories through writing. And while I was in school, I kind of got the little, the news that journalism was kind of a dying art. They kind of pushed (laughs) us away from journalism in terms of what we were studying in school. So I started with public relations and marketing. And that's kind of where I I started to get exposed a little bit more to social media. And long story short, I had a really awesome internship and mentor while I was in college and she had an online business. She worked completely by herself, remote. I had never heard of any of that, (laughs) but she really planted the seed that if we wanted to build our own thing that we could. Mm. And so a few years later, I was having the crisis of what do I do when I graduate, right? What's that next step? What's my career? And so I called her up and I said, hey, I was thinking of doing social media for small businesses. What do you think? She said, go for it. I'll give you your first client. (laughs) And so that's where I started Soul Studio, which is now Shine with Natasha. And so I did social media management and now have transitioned more into Instagram and video education, coaching and resources. So that's a long story short. And I have literally been there from the beginning. And so I, as someone who likes to watch and kind of study businesses and how people use different strategies to grow, for you, like in the beginning, even the name change, right? Like why change the name and how have you decided to modify your services through the years? Yes. Great question. So when I first started my business, I just took any tool or any skill that I already knew from my experience and I did everything under the sun, which I feel like I would really recommend to new entrepreneurs. I realized very quickly what I did not like, who I did not (laughs) like working for. And when I wasn't making enough money for the service that I was providing, that kind of led me to niching more down to Instagram management, Mm. specifically small business owners. And so I did that for about two years. I had a fully booked out roster of clients. I worked some with some really big entrepreneurs, product brands, service providers, And when we came to 2020, I was not only at capacity, but I feel like my brand had this major blow up moment. Mm -hmm. And along with just everything that was happening in 2020, I got burnt out from social media management really quickly because social media managers are on the back end saying Mm -hmm. pause content because we don't know what this COVID thing is and pause content because things are happening politically. And with Black Lives Matter and so many things were happening. Mm -hmm. And I think managing that along with my kind of personal brand that was really blossoming and growing, I was starting to get really awesome speaking opportunities. I was starting to partner with brands. I was kind of like the first person on the reels boat with the 30 day reels challenge, which like really took off. We had like over 2000 people join. And I feel like I realized I was like in this crossroads of I could continue Mm. growing soul studio as like an agency and hire people on and manage the agency and manage clients. But I realized that managing people wasn't really my passion. Like I loved creating and helping Mm. more people, as many people as I could to create as well. And so that's when I knew that I had to make that shift. And like, 
part of it was like, I'd be on podcasts and be speaking. And I was like, soul studio. And then I had to explain that it was SOL and like <laughs> people knew my name and they it was like partially just like people identified it as me, but also because I was moving away from a studio and more into that personal brand. So mm. the name change felt a little difficult. And even mm. now, a few years later, I'm still continuing to grow and evolve my brand into this like completely, not completely new direction, but its own distinct thing. But I think for leaning more into the shine with Natasha brand, it felt like the natural next step. And I feel like a lot of people that have been around since day one, including yourself, once I made the shift, everyone's like, oh, this kind of feels the same. Like I totally get it. Like it makes total sense. So yeah, that's how I went about changing the name. And I think it was definitely the best move for me at that time. It was interesting too, because I saw in, in 20, like how, like even your Instagram numbers, it was like, poof, it like blew Literally. up. <laughs> And so I was like, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine because people are probably like calling you, wanting to work with you. And then it's just like, okay, number one, I'm trying to deal with all the things that are just going on in this world mentally. And then trying to deal with kind of like the increased traffic and with increased traffic too is increased comments. And so, oh, did yeah. you- <laughs> so like, yes. how did you like deal with that? Not only just like trying to make sure you're, Um, trying to stay engaged with a lot more people but then there's going to be some comments that are like not so nice so how did you like balance that (laughs) yeah I think like it's really funny a few months before my account blew up I created this like really sassy post where I was like this is why I don't want 10,000 followers (laughs) and it was because I was so used to fostering a small community and I really had no major dreams of having thousands and thousands of followers. And so quite literally for like a numbers reference, when before we started the summer, I was around like 4,000, like close to 5,000 followers. And just by the end of the summer, so in like two months, I was at 10,000. By the end of the year, I was at 20,000. So it was like an insane growth year. And I think some people see it in their social media, but they don't see it in their business. But it was my biggest revenue year to date. I quite literally like mm-hmm. tripled my revenue from the year before. So I think that's like the other side of the coin is like the operations in the back end of the business. Like I quite yeah. literally couldn't keep up. And yeah, I think that's a, where a lot of my social media burnout kind of came from is not only was I managing my own comments, DMs, but I was managing it for my clients as well. Mm-hmm. And honestly, mm-hmm. I don't think I've fully adjusted to the amount <laughs> of engagement and comments and DMs that I get. It's still like a pain point for me because it's something that I have decided not to delegate off. Like I love connecting with my community and I want it to be me that people are engaging with. Mm. I think what I've had to do is just create really strict boundaries of removing and not responding to things that absolutely don't need my response. Like I get so many messages of like, can you help me with my Instagram? No, hi, no, hello, no, <laughs> nothing. And I'm like, ma'am, sir, no, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I don't work for Instagram. I'm not a dictionary. I'm not Google, right? So I think it's had to be a lot of those boundaries of like, I humanly possibly cannot go through every comment and DM and giving myself the grace that like, people won't dislike me because of it. And if they do, then like, that's, I can't do anything about it. So yeah. With that increase in like revenue and and just jobs, did you kind of shift as far as like, maybe, you know, for example, taking less clientele, but maybe charging more? Like, how did you start to, to balance your time without it impacting your revenue too much? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing that I was doing, even before I made the full switch to the shine with Natasha is I started taking what I was doing for my clients and turning it into courses. Mm. And so uh, course sales were a small part of my income, but eventually became a bigger part of my income and eventually became my signature programs that I sell and launch today. I think the other side of it is In 2020, when I made that decision of I'm moving to shine with Natasha, I'm going out of social media management, I knew for myself, and I had like my own level of privilege of doing this is like, I knew that I couldn't have a roster of social media management clients while still being able to focus on the projects that were going to propel me to that next level of business, Mm. which Mm. is also really Mm. scary. So quite literally by the end of the year, I told all of my clients that I was 
essentially closing down that part of my business. Mm. I fired them, I guess you could say. (laughs) (laughs) Which is scary. It has to be scary. Yeah. So scary. (laughs) I remember for one of the calls, it was one of my bigger clients. And I remember like literally, because of course we're in COVID time. So like my fiance Marlon's like in the living room, like right across the way, like I can literally see him and I'm on the call and we're just going over things before I was going to like, you know, fire them. And I remember under the table texting him and being like, I don't think I can do it. Like, I literally don't think I can do it. And he texts me back. He's like, you have to, like, you have to do it. So yes, it was very, very difficult. But yeah, I got rid of all my clients. I passed them along to people that I trusted. Mm. And what I essentially did is I turned what I did with my social media management clients into VIP days. So that was kind of like my plan mm, B mm, of like, mm. that was like all of my income for the most part. So I was like, okay, let me take courses and resources. Let me take my, what I'm doing for social media management and turn it into VIP days. So I'm spending one day a month for clients, <laughs> not every day during a month. And that went over really well. And so that was what helped me transition out of it. And I've also so done, you know, paid, I eventually got paid more for speaking, paid mm. more for brand partnerships. So I essentially kind of diversified my income across a lot of different things once we started to kind of make that transition. But it was absolutely scary because there's a lot of ways I could have gone <laughs> around it. Like I could have kept my clients on, but it definitely would have been slower growth. And I think I felt like I had so much to, to run with it and see where it would take me. It's interesting because you you mentioned like you passed on some of your clients to other folks that did the same thing you did that you trusted. So one thing, you know, that came up in a survey that I put out to my newsletter because I was like checking on the health and well-being and I'm like, how can I help you? What topics can I help you with? And someone was like building a community that's not on Facebook. For you, how how did you build that community? Because I'm assuming, but you could correct me if I'm wrong, like some of the people that you trusted were people that you met along the way, right? That were in that same niche that you were. Uh, and I'm sure you've, you've connected with others too, but how have you been able to kind of like build your community of people that you can kind of trust and bounce ideas off of? Yeah, absolutely. I think at, at one time I was really scrappy and like going to in-person events. That's where I would connect with a lot of people And quite literally, I use social media as a networking platform from day one before I had the follower count to build my status, I guess you could say. I would just reach out to people and say that I love what they were doing or I love their content and did you want to collab on a live and like all those types of things. Like the things that I tell my clients to do, I was doing before I had a lot of followers. And it's still the way that I operate is I always just use social media as a community building platform. Mm -hmm. But I also do things off of social media. So when I'm speaking in person and when I was going to a lot of networking events pre-pandemic, I'm very much an introverted person. But I also know as a business, like the people you know and the connections you have are everything. (laughs) And I truly think that with my brand growing up, like I think those kind of viral big growth moments often come with like luck and timing, right? Like you can't predict them. Mm -hmm. But I do think that I was doing a lot of the work on the back end that I didn't know that connection or that brand that I was tagging or that person I was building a relationship with, that that would then lead to an opportunity or someone to refer me for something. So I feel like it's just always been a way that I've operated and thought of social media. And I think we often think of creating content and showing up and like putting so much out there, but I don't think we think enough about how can we actually use it to have that two-way conversation, which has always been a focus of mine. Yeah. And I forgot to ask just to give kind of people a a perspective on how long you've been working on this. Like when did you uh, first start your business? What year was that? Yes. January, 2018. So we are coming up on year five. Wow. That's like a, that's a huge milestone in business. That's (laughs) impressive. Yes, Yes, absolutely. (laughs) So before we get into some Instagram and just like video tips, I also wanted to ask you, and I I feel like I see the shift, but, you know, please correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes people are afraid to kind of like niche down into something, especially when it comes to maybe they're the Asana expert or the Twitter expert or so forth, because if, if that platform goes dead, you're like, oh my God, what do I do? 
how, any kind of words of advice? Because I feel like you became, to me, like the IG expert. If I like saw like guides were out, I'd be like, okay, Natasha is going to put out a video <laughs> on what this means and how I can use it. But I feel like I've seen a shift where you're still like the Instagram expert, but you're also becoming like this video expert too, right? Like that's more general niche that could apply to anything. Mm -hmm. But if you could kind of like just talk more about that, because I think that's why sometimes people are afraid to niche down, not realizing that there's opportunities to pivot, if that makes sense. Totally. Yeah. I think that niching down is something that we all know is important in business on social media, but I often don't find that a lot of the ways people talk about niching down really resonates with me because I think Mm -hmm. it comes across as find your thing, stick to your thing, do the thing. (laughs) Forever and and ever. Right? (laughs) There's no flexibility there. There's no balance. There's no growth. There's no evolution. (laughs) And I think that's when, like, I know when I was starting my business, I felt such a pressure to find my niche, to niche down where I didn't Mm -hmm. even know what I would niche down on. And eventually that happened over time and I'm still discovering that. So, so yeah, I think that niching down and having an area of expertise, whether it's the people you serve, how you serve them, the types of content you create, the types of services you offer, I think can be incredibly, incredibly valuable. I also don't think niching down needs to be the nichiest niche niche, right? <laughs> like niching down for me meant Instagram content for a long time and that served me really well. I think the more that I've continued to grow and scale my business, Business, I realized Instagram's not my only social media platform. It's not what I recommend for my clients. I love email. I'm playing around with YouTube and TikTok, right? I really believe in like content omnipresence. And it's not because everyone's poo-pooing on Instagram nowadays. I still love Instagram. It's still my top platform. Me and my clients are still making money there, right? So it's not that we're getting rid of Instagram. <laughs> But I think there's ways that we can embrace the the waves of social media, which I think is really what I'm leaning into more is how can I help people do that? And I think video has always been one of my favorite parts of Instagram. And I think going back to when I talked about my story, like storytelling was always at the heart of what I loved. And like, yes, I could do that with captions and photos and graphics, but I feel like video is such a powerful storytelling tool. So it it totally felt natural of like, yes, Instagram's still like my main platform. It's still what I'm going to use to teach a lot of the strategies that I do. But I also feel like it's okay to expand and grow and pivot that niche mm-hmm. as well, which I feel like is a season I'm in right now. So yeah. I feel like once we embrace that, like, there's not an end journey with business and content and social media. We can give ourselves space to evolve. We don't fall victim to being in something that no longer serves us Mm -hmm. because I think that's something I I feel like I've gotten right for the most part over the past little while (laughs) as I've talked about like I pivoted away from social media management now I'm kind of I pivoted away from courses and now I'm pivoting into more a video direction and I feel like I've always kind of allowed myself to grow knowing there's not a final destination. And I feel like I've also made room in my brand to really Mm -hmm. have those foundational elements of like my brand when I was Soul Studio really isn't that different than my brand now. And I feel like that's what has also made it a lot easier for me to evolve over the years. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And okay. So Instagram. (laughs) And So first of all, listeners out there, if you do not follow Natasha, just follow her. You can flip through all the things and learn so many tips. So I'm going to try not to get weedy because literally all I have to do is go to your Instagram (laughs) and learn all the things. But I think like a question people have is like, if I didn't start in the beginning when Instagram was hot, does it make sense? Right? Like it is it still a way for me to generate revenue through Instagram coming in late in the game? So curious to get your, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I really love this question. And 
I, I think first and foremost, I'll explain why I like Instagram. And I think that this will give a, a few reasons why it might be a good starter platform for any business. Mm. And the reason why is there's multiple ways to connect and build and nurture a community because it's not just one type of content. There's stories, right? There's feed posts, there's reels, there's lives, there's the DMs, there's the comments. I feel like there's so many ways to connect deeper with your audience. And I feel like that's really where the strength comes with Instagram. And I feel like that's also why Instagram was my first platform. Mm -hmm. It has really helped inform all the other platforms. It's like, now that I know how to Instagram, I can figure out how to do all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. So I definitely feel like lean into who's the ideal person you're trying to connect with. And do you think they're on Instagram? Chances are they are because it's definitely one of the biggest social media (laughs) platforms still out there. And you absolutely still can can grow. I will also add in a little bit of a preface of, I feel like Instagram has never been the type of discovery app as Mm. like YouTube or TikTok is, which I feel like Mm. was where a lot of people get things wrong when people Mm. compare Instagram to TikTok and YouTube. Like even when hashtags were really big on Instagram, right? That still was like the main way covered on the app, but I don't think it meant that you were reaching hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people at a time. Mm -hmm. I feel like you were able to reach all the right people. But TikTok is a type of place where you are constantly discovering, right? You're going on the app thinking you're going to discover new content, just like with Mm -hmm. YouTube recommendations. So I think that if you wanted to do two platforms, having a discovery platform like TikTok and then having a main nurture Mm -hmm. platform like Instagram could be what I would probably recommend for a client now in this state of social (laughs) media. But I also think that less is often more. I had barely a thousand, barely 2000. Like I had a small audience for so long and I feel like once you learn how to monetize a small audience you can then make money with the 40,000 or 40,000 follower audience which is now what I have right I think people often think the more growth the more audience they get when they're starting out the better but um, sometimes you can just start your Instagram account and see a little bit of growth and actually see just as great results in your business so that's kind of my complicated answer but hopefully (laughs) give people a few ideas on where I would start. No, I love that because it was probably several, several episodes ago, but I was kind of talking about this because I was telling people, like, I've talked to entrepreneurs who don't have that many followers, but they're making six figures a year, right? And so I'm like, it, it really just depends on the type of work, how you're marketing overall, and you don't have to have a ton of followers in order to, like make enough to live off of. But I think sometimes people get caught up like, oh my goodness, if I don't have 20,000 followers, then my business will fail. And it's like, no, 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 20,000 will definitely help you if you know how to market, but it's not the only thing. Yeah. (laughs) I'm also just curious too, because I know you're getting a lot deeper into video and some of the things people are saying is like, oh my God, I wish Instagram would be more about the pictures again. (laughs) I miss the pictures. What are your thoughts on that? Because I I feel like people are still posting pictures and depending on what type of account they have and what they cover, pictures still do really well, but it is just video is like super hot right now, right? It's like the future. (laughs) Yes. And oh, there's so much to cover here because yes, I think we've all seen it over the past little while. So I think I want to first preface is that yes, I still think you can post photos, graphics, if it makes sense for your brand. So like photographers, they always get a little upset with me. Yes, still post your photos, please. I want you to post your photos. (laughs) But I want to talk a little bit more about the video part. So I I think the first element is understanding that video isn't completely new. It is very hard right now to your point but it's not new right no. when IGTV came out when we had stories when lives had its boom in 2020 right like reels wasn't the first iteration of video on Instagram mm-hmm. and I think that that really shows the power of video that it's not just this new thing and it goes back to what I've been saying about storytelling A photo can tell a story, a caption can tell a story and explain things, 
but a video has multiple elements that can tell a story and build better connection so much deeper than just a photo or a graphic or a caption because we have not only the visual and how it's moving, we also have the audio, whether it's music or the person talking or the sound effects of pouring something, right? We also have the text element. Maybe you're adding text for context or transcription, right? So there's all these different elements that go into a video and that's what helps it tell such a compelling story. And it makes me think of like, why do we like sitting down, watching, watching TV and Netflix and movies over staring at a graphic all day. Right. Mm -hmm, I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's probably a lot of really cool <laughs> studies on why, I don't yeah. know why, but there's something that just is so engaging and almost like transports you and really makes you feel like you're more deeply connected with people because mm -hmm. you can actually hear how I sound. You can see how I move. You can see my mannerisms. And I feel like that is something that other mediums can't necessarily translate along with the fact that platforms are making it where content like reels are going to get so much more reach and engagement than other pieces of content. So mm -hmm. I definitely don't think it, it needs to be the only piece of content, but even when I was doing social media management years ago, it was always something that I really encourage my clients to do because it is going to help you strategically as a business. Yeah. Yeah. I, yes. And yes. <laughs> Another thing I feel like people get caught up in and love to hear your thoughts on this too, is they're just like video. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Even a one minute TikTok video or a 10 minute YouTube video, right? And so for you, you're the boss at cranking out that content. I'm like, go Natasha. So how do you like produce content without it completely burning you out because it's the filming, the editing, making sure you're posting in, in good enough intervals. Like what is, what advice do you have for people? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think the first element I'm going to say is I feel like there's also been a push towards you have to push post more content. Mm. And I also don't think I fall under that. I maybe mm -hmm. post three to four times a week, maybe five if I'm feeling wild. I don't post on weekends. I don't post every single day on stories, right? Yeah. So I think that we can post sustainably even when it comes to video content. So that's the first element. But what I really think it comes down to is your systems and your skill set. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to skill set, I want to be super clear that no one missed a video class on how to show up on video and talk to your phone, right? We didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> you did not miss out. But I think not enough times do we realize that it is quite literally a new skill. Talking mm -hmm. to your camera, putting together video clips, editing content, all of that is a skill set. And when I first started doing stories, when I first did my first IGTV, my first reel, they were probably not the best, right? <laughs> but because I continued posting them time after time again, and not only were they not the best, they probably took me a lot longer than they do now. I practiced and I developed that skill. So I know that's like the most annoying tip I can give, but it really is the best way to get better at something when it's hard, when it's messy, when it's imperfect, that's when you need to be starting and really creating that video content. So that's like the first element of it. And then the other element is systems. And this is like yeah. where my like dirty social media manager hat comes out because <laughs> it was absolutely necessary for me to operate, right? I wasn't just creating my own content. I was creating content for upwards to eight to 10 brands at one time. Yeah. So it was really necessary for me to have the systems. And these are just a few systems that I think everyone should have. The first being a place where your content ideas actually live. I think a common mistake people do is they sit down, look at their phone and they're like, okay, what am I creating today? Right. <laughs> sometimes we'll eventually get to that stage, right? Like I create very fluidly now because I've been doing it for years, but it's more important that you don't just rely on your brain to be creative when you're actually creating. We want to store those ideas when we have them, when you're on your walk, after you get out of the shower, when you get off a coaching call, when you see something and you have an idea, when you get a DM question, we want to store all those ideas when they come to us, mm -hmm. really have a place where they're living. 
I also feel like another element of that is also outlining the, those ideas before you film or create content, because I think video can take so much time when we don't know the clips that we need, when we don't have something to follow along with, when we're actually talking. Like when I do my talking videos, I'm like looking at notes and I'm like pausing and I'm stopping. And if I say something wrong, I'm saying it again and I'll just edit that out. Right. So I think we put so much pressure on ourselves to deliver the content in one go when we have to understand it's like a process and a workflow. And I think that's the last step is that, as you mentioned, there's all these moving parts to the content, which I feel like applies to other pieces of content too. But Mm -hmm. like, we're getting the idea, we're filming it, we're editing it, we're writing the caption, we're doing the cover, (laughs) we're we're posting it, right? The biggest tip I can give you is don't do them all in one sitting, right? (laughs) I have a day where I film I have a moment where I edit. I have a day where I sit down and write captions and schedule things. There's so many different ways you can set up a batching workflow, essentially, of creating content in bulk. But yeah, I I think just having those systems and skills, allowing yourself to discover, support you to show up on video, even when you don't have the ideas or you aren't feeling energetic or inspired to do so. I think that's super helpful. It's so funny because... I feel like, for example, when I come to my podcast, I'm very organized. I got my little stuff in Notion. I'm like, batch, boom, record, editing, (laughs) boom. When it comes to me creating YouTube videos, (laughs) I wish it, I feel like it always takes me multiple hours to edit it. Totally. Because I really haven't scripted it out. You know, I might have a few outlines, but I'm like, if I did a better job, I would be faster at it, right? So I think those are mm-hmm. awesome, awesome tips. And it's funny because thinking about what you were saying, even even before the last question, it's weird when I'm like looking for podcast guests, I look at people's videos because I want to see and hear like how they engage with their audience. And that gives me a sense of how they might resonate with my audience. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so Absolutely. pictures can't do that. Right. But video can. And that's how you get speaking engagements, podcasts, asked to be on podcasts, Or even someone is like, oh, I resonate with this person. I want to hire them as a consultant because I feel like I connect with them because I can hear them and and see them in, in in a way where you can't. I'm not saying I am all about the static images photographers, especially LaKea, if you're listening out there, my photography buddy. <laughs> but video also adds that that element of connection in there that that is really useful, I think, to, for businesses. Yeah, I totally um, agree. So before I get to kind of my last wrap up questions, I think another thing people grapple with when it comes to Instagram or just creating video content on any platform is how can I generate revenue? Like how is the work I put in for this going to help me and help my business? And I know you've mentioned kind of some of the ways you've diversified your income through the years via consulting courses like the VIP day or speaking engagements or working with brand partners. But how do you like, for people, they want to know like, well, how does that translate? Like I do this video on Instagram, but how do I get someone to be a brand partner or to pick me up as a speaker? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's to the point that you mentioned is like using Instagram as your own stage, Mm -hmm. going live and putting it together like a mini podcast episode or a mini webinar, right? Using talking videos. I know some, there's obviously so many different ways to create video content, but I need you to maybe not do as many trends and do more talking to camera, like really Mm -hmm. helpful pieces of content. Mm -hmm. I think another thing is really being okay with leaning into your own methodologies, your own unique ways of thinking, unpopular opinions, spicy thoughts, like what, however you want to say it. I feel like those are really helpful for sh- sharing thought leadership. I know mm, when mm. Jenna Kutcher from the Gold Digger podcast uh, slid in yeah. my DMs asking me to be on her podcast, it was quite literally because I did a video where I was like, y'all stop freaking out about this photo thing video is okay. Right. I was like, don't panic. Okay. And she said it resonated (laughs) and that's what gave her the inspiration for having me on her podcast. So I feel like 
not even the niche element that we were talking about before, but just really being okay with having your own unique thoughts, perspectives, frameworks, methodologies, because that's what people are wanting to have on their stages, their shows. That's the type of people that they're wanting to partner with in content. If you're wanting to partner with brands, start tagging them and things, right? Mm. It took me literally years <laughs> of tagging later before they not only finally followed me back, but a whole other year before they even <laughs> paid me anything and partnered with me and had me speak right so you gotta tag them you gotta start building that relationship you gotta comment on them like the more and more that they see your little account pop up the more and more chances you'll have of being in their court when they're looking for that and like create organic content for them before they start hiring you go to their events and share on Instagram stories before you're speaking at those events. So mm. I have honestly bar barely done any pitching over the last five years, but I've landed some really awesome partnerships and opportunities. And it's because I use Instagram as this vessel to not only mm. share my expertise, but to build those relationships. So I feel like those are really easy ways that people can kind of shift how they're showing up to really build thought leadership and authority to attract those opportunities. I love it because, you know, it kind of like it hits on, I think, something that I think sometimes people think, oh, if someone tells me exactly what to do, then I'm going to be rolling in the dough and get money. But it's kind of like deeper than that. It's having the confidence. It's not being like embarrassed to tag a brand partner multiple times because you think you're going to be annoying. It's not being afraid to show your face on camera because you don't feel like you look perfect that day and really just being who you are instead of who you think you should be. And that takes a lot of courage. And I feel like what you just hit on is like really changing your mindset and being more comfortable with putting yourself out there in new and different ways. Yeah. I love how you <laughs> summarized in that way. Cause that's really what it is. It's like having the audacity to show up and ask and be big and take up space. And I want to also preface that like that took years mm. to develop yeah. when, first of all, I kind of was like oblivious to like, I was, I'm afraid of this. Like at first I was like <laughs> so naive that I didn't even know what I was doing was so scary. <laughs> and then once I realized it was so scary, I kind of was like, what's the worst thing that can really happen? If it's me not getting the opportunity, it's them never following me back. If it's me never speaking on that stage, then I'm where I am if I didn't show up, right? But I think that when we really think of the one person that we could be impacting that one opportunity, and it's always what I see with my clients when we're talking about thought leadership is like, they're like, I, I feel like I've been showing up. Like I'm, I am showing up. And I'm like, but it's like, it could be that one more post. It could be that one more DM. We have to continue to show up because you never know. And just like practicing that muscle as well, because I feel like just in the last month, I've started to just be like, I'm just going to ask for this. I'm just going to tell them I want to do this. Like, I'm just <laughs> going to put it out there. Like, yes, I want to attract it. But like, I practice that muscle enough where I'm like, sometimes you just got to ask and really put out there what we want to attract. And it's not easy work, but it's definitely worth it. You heard it here. You heard it here, people. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot to ask you too, did you, because this is sometimes what people struggle with too. Have you built like a team, like as far as like VA or people to help you with marketing or are you still like, mm, I can, I can, I, I can do it manager. all. <laughs> I am my own social media manager. <laughs> I do have a team. I have someone that helps with operations, back end, mm. inbox. I do have someone that helps me with email marketing. I have someone that helps me with graphics. Mm. So I have people that help me with certain elements, but I still am very much the visionary of all of my content and am a part of every content idea, especially on Instagram and my social medias. I have a podcast editor. I have a YouTube editor. So I definitely have help because I've realized where my strengths are and like keeping me out of the weeds of things has helped me just expand and continue to create more content. But I would say I still do probably a lot more than other people that are like mm. social media people. And I, I think that's okay though, because I feel like you can still feel it in my content. And I feel like I'm mm. not to the point just yet where I want to be completely removed from that. I, I still really enjoy it. <laughs> no, 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 that's fair. That's fair. 
Okay, so a couple of wrap-up questions. How do you stay organized? Do you have any tools, software, or techniques you want to pass on to the listeners? <sighs> That'd be a whole <laughs> podcast episode of itself. Oh my gosh. Definitely a project management tool for tasks. I love ClickUp. I love scheduling my content with a tool like Later or Planoly. I also love Airtable for spreadsheets, for forms, Calendly for booking events. Dubsado for onboarding clients, Thrivecar for my programs. I'm just going to leave it there because I would, <laughs> I would name them all. <laughs> and folks, I will link all of those in the show notes. But once you find like tools that work, people know I love me some tools, right? Now I'll experiment with yeah. new tools sometimes, but when you find ones that work, they save you so much time, right? Yeah. It's almost like having someone working for you. Okay. So next question, do you have a hobby? Ooh, do I have a hobby? I feel like I would say my hobbies is reading a hobby. Yeah. It's yeah, like Pilates it's like and yoga hobby. Away. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so those are probably my hobbies. Those. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of take you away from work and yes. it's your way of just like having fun, decompressing. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Those are them. And also just like cooking and baking. I also enjoy oh, a lot. Those, yes, that counts too. <laughs> <laughs> and then where can the listeners find you? Please let them know any anything you want them to know about social media, website, you name it. Yeah, absolutely. So definitely connect with me over on Instagram at Shine with <laughs> Natasha. I'm also on YouTube at Shine with Natasha and TikTok as well. YouTube's great for longer form tutorials. And TikTok, I'm just playing around and experimenting. So definitely follow along there. And I'm also working on this really exciting new mm. video confidence challenge that's going to help mm. you create video content in five minutes or less a day. Ooh. So it's currently in the works. It might be out when this airs, but it's going to be at <laughs> shinewithatasha.com slash video and I'll be sharing about that super soon so definitely join me on that challenge perfect well Natasha really appreciate you sharing your story and sharing like all the tips so you know thank you thank you thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule I, I really enjoyed this conversation Yes. Thank you so much for having me. I loved all your questions. Wow. Oh my goodness. I know I am inspired just listening back to this episode. So I go, I hope you guys really enjoyed this too. If you did, sharing is caring, my friends. So please share, share away. Please rate me five stars on Apple. Please give me a thumbs up if you're listening on YouTube. Please remember to subscribe wherever you are listening. It is always, always appreciated. Definitely remember to check out and follow Natasha. She's really amazing. She always gives great tips. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, as you try to get organized and figure out your next steps, remember to check out my storefront, dreamsplansideas.com. I've got all kinds of stuff over there from the Notion template that I mentioned earlier to my life cleanse journal that forces you to ask tough and weird questions about yourself in different categories and to take action, my friends, to take actions on those things. It has worked for me. It's helped me manifest and take and create plans and take actions on the things that I want. So I really do live by what I am putting out there. So be sure to check it out. If you ever have any questions for me, you can hit me up via email. Hello at nishesnow.com. Okay. With that said, I have another amazing episode coming up next week. It's with my co-host and we are talking about... AI, my friends. Yes. So LaKay and I are actually hopefully getting together very soon to really talk about how artificial intelligence can help you. All right. Take care. 